Good morning, Calvary Quakertown. It's good to have you join us this morning. And as you just saw from the short little video, we are back in Romans today. So if you would, take your Bibles, your phone, if you use version or another version on your phone, a tablet, your computer, whatever you use to read the Bible, and turn to Romans chapter 8. If you don't know where Romans is, the easiest way to find it, go to the table of contents, find Romans, it's almost near the end, find the page number, go, and turn to chapter 8. And we're going to look at the first few verses of Romans chapter 8 today as we get back in the game. The Romans game, the for everyone game, the therefore everyone game uh, that we started back in September. So Romans 8 verse 1, therefore, well we need to stop right there because we have a problem. Did you notice? The word therefore means as a result of, in consequence of, Because that happened, this is now going to happen, or this is true, and we haven't been in Romans for five weeks, and I know, therefore, you have forgotten everything we've said about Romans from the fall. So if what happens in Romans 8 is in consequence, and as a result of Romans 1 through 7, we need to do a little bit of a reminder, because the word therefore means in consequence of, as a result of. For example, Carson Wentz has a broken back. Therefore, he hasn't played football for a few weeks. See how that works? Nick Foles will ask for way too much money. Therefore, he will not play for the Eagles next year. We had a deadly, treacherous weather report yesterday. Therefore, 25% of Calvary Church didn't show up today. You see how that works? as a result of, in consequent, that's what therefore is, which means in order to understand what Paul's going to talk about in chapter 8, we need to make sure we have in mind what happened in 1 through 7. And that's a little bit of a problem because we haven't been there for five weeks. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a few minutes to kind of remind ourselves of what's in 1 through 7 in very broad strokes. So let me give you a quick thumbnail sketch of Romans. The book of Romans is actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in the ancient city of Rome. Now, Paul started out his career, and you can read about Paul's journey in the book of Acts, chapter 9. You see the big transition. Paul started out his journey as a religious leader within Judaism. And he was strict and he was devout and he jumped through all the hoops and he knew where all the hoops were. But he had an amazing life altering experience when he met Jesus on a journey in which he was persecuting Christians. Well, his life was dramatically changed. And in that journey, Jesus not only calls him to be a follower, Jesus sends him out to tell other people about that message. So that's what the word apostle means, right? Apostle means somebody who's sent. So Paul is called in as a follower and sent out as an apostle. That's what he does. And Paul's actually doing missional work while he writes this this letter. So here's what's going on. Paul traveled around the Mediterranean sharing that message of Jesus with pretty much anybody who would listen. Listen. And in the book of Acts, we have three of those missional journeys recorded. It was on the third of those journeys that he wrote this letter. Now, the third missionary journey had a slightly different purpose than the first two. On Paul's third journey, he was collecting money. He was raising money. Not for himself, so he could buy a new car or something. He was raising money for the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem because their lives were pretty difficult because remember, they gave up Judaism in a sense. Now they're following Jesus. They were losing jobs. They were having their properties taken. Their lives were really in a desperate situation. So Paul is raising money that he's then going to deliver to the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem. While he's on that journey, he fires this letter off to the Christians in Rome. And here's the reason. Paul wanted to go to Spain. And if you remember your basic Mediterranean Sea 
geography here. Jerusalem is kind of at one end of the Mediterranean. Spain is at the opposite end of the Mediterranean. Rome is kind of halfway in the middle. So Paul believed Jesus wanted him to go to Rome and he kept thinking, you know what? He was enough of a supply chain guy that he knew the supply chain is really long from Jerusalem to Spain. I'm not gonna be able to do it. So I'll need a base of operations about halfway there. So he looked at a map probably and said, oh, Rome's halfway there. So he fires off this letter saying, hey, I'm going to be coming and visiting you guys soon. And what's the purpose of the visit? To set up a new base of operations so that when he goes to Spain, the supply chain will be half of what it would be if he was going from Jerusalem. So in order to help them and help them become supporters, Paul says, let me tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about my message. And that's kind of what Romans is, a description of Paul's life and a description of Paul's mission, his message. And that's why we have so much in there. So that's kind of looking back on the big picture. But if you want to understand the theme of Romans, you really have to read no further than right in the middle of the first chapter. In the middle of the first chapter, in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, we actually have kind of the theme of Romans. So here it is. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, the gospel, I know, sounds like a churchy word because we're in church. All the word gospel means is good news. And so Paul says, hey, I'm not ashamed of good news. Who in their right mind is afraid of good news or ashamed of it? Paul said, I love good news and I'm sharing good news. This good news that I have, the gospel in particular, is the power of God that brings salvation or rescues people, everyone. Everybody's rescued through this message and only through this message. Jews are rescued through this message, Gentiles, for it's the gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed. So if you remember, God's requirement was righteousness. God kind of said, hey, here's how I want you guys to live. The requirement is live as God said because he's the creator, he's the author of life, live this way. We failed in producing that righteousness. So now we try to kind of produce it however we can, but Paul says, I've got great news. God is delivering righteousness another way. You're never going to be able to do it yourself. God has so decided, the good news is, there is a righteousness from God and it's revealed, it's coming in the person of Jesus. So now you don't have to work for it, you have to have to receive it as a gift. So that's kind of the overarching message. I've given you a, a couple of simple little outlines. Hopefully you keep them in mind. Uh, if not, here they are one more time. The first three chapters of Romans present the problem and Paul, like a good teacher, says, here's the predicament, chapter one through three. All of us are under this cloud of condemnation and judgment. We're all guilty, but God provides a solution. That's the good news. The solution is Jesus came to take our place. He lived the life we should have lived, died the death we, desi we deserve to die, and now calls us to continue what he started. That's the solution. The results are manifold. Chapter five gives us some of the results and in chapter eight, he gives us most of the results um, that we'll tease out the next couple of weeks. Another way to put together the first few chapters of Romans is to think about the first five chapters as being what God has done for us and then in six through eight, what God is doing in us. So God accomplished all these things in Jesus for us, they're delivered to us, but God's not content just to do things for us on the outside, he says, now, I'm going to take that message that God accomplished on the outside and I'm going to energize you to live it on the inside. So the first five chapters, what God has done for us, six or eight, what God now does in us. And in chapter eight, we'll see lots of stuff that God's doing in us. Another way to think about the same thing, the chapters is, God deals with the penalty of sin in the first five chapters. He deals with the power of sin in the next three chapters. He takes care of the penalty because Jesus paid it. He takes care of the power because now he puts the spirit in us to bring about that transformation and change so that now we have a power source to live as God wanted us to. So that's kind of a picture of how it works. Another way um, that you may want to look at the beginning part of the, of the letter is like this. To understand the gospel is to understand the buts. And we did a whole message on the buts back in the fall, but I want to tease out three buts for you. 
right? Not B-U-T-T, that's a different thing. We're at B-U-T, three buts that will help us understand all that Romans has and all that Paul has in mind as he now transitions to chapter eight, all right? So here's the gospel in the buts. Romans 3.21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke to a, a number of college students, I guess about a thousand of them, and it was kind of interesting to listen to the conversations before, after, in the hallways, at the, at the, at the tables where, where they were eating. The main topic of conversation, transcripts. I guess they had gotten their transcripts over the Christmas break. They're working on their transcripts. And those that were interested most in their transcripts were graduating this May. Because your transcripts determine whether you get into the right grad school, whether you get a good job, whether you're gonna be hired by this person or that person. Transcripts are all important. Well, if you think in terms of transcripts, you can kind of understand Paul's message. Here's what he says. God desires righteousness. That's the requirement. So what do we do? We want to produce righteousness on our transcripts. So we try really hard. The problem is we all screw up. We've got major blemishes on our transcripts. And try as hard as you will, you can't remove the bad marks on the transcript. I realize that, you know, in college, you can take the course over again and kind of get it removed. It doesn't work that way in life. It doesn't work that way before God. If you got a bad mark, you got a condemnation on your transcript, there's no way to get it off. But Paul says, but now... You can have a transcript that's perfect. You can have a transcript to get in the med school. You can have a transcript to get in a law school. You can have a transcript that opens the right doors. Transcripts and resumes open the right doors for us. Paul says, you were working on a transcript, but your transcript won't open the doors you want open. But the good news is, but even though you you weren't able to produce the transcript you wanted to open the right doors, but God has produced a perfect transcript, Jesus' transcript. And Jesus wants to take your transcript with the blemishes and give you his perfect transcript. So even though you failed, but God came up with a different plan and he will trade transcripts with you. But that's a pretty good but, isn't it? Maybe the summary but of the whole letter is in 623. For the wages of sin is death. What what have we produced? What have we earned, right? Wages are things you earn. Wages are things you deserve. So what have we earned and what do we deserve? Death. Not just physical death when we die. Death is an alienation, separation from God and his plan, the abundant life he wants us to have forever and ever. But, there's the but. So that, what have we earned? We've earned alienation. We've earned death. But the gift of God is life, but that life is in Jesus. When you take Jesus, you get the life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have that life as God intended. If you have Jesus, you have the life. They go together. They can't be separated. See the big but. So, but, the wages of sin is that, but the free gift of God. You don't work for or earn a gift, you just receive a gift. You work for and deserve wages. And so this is kind of the summary statement, you could look at it that way, of the whole first seven chapters of Romans. The wages of sin, what we've deserved is death, alienation, separation, but God gives us a gift, life, and everything that he intended, reconciliation, eternal life, quality, quantity, shalom, all those good things are found in Jesus. That's a big but. Well, there's one other but that I wanted to mention, and this one isn't, you know, about what is accomplished and delivered to us. This is the but that we need to exercise based on the buts that God has delivered, 611. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We kind of ended our series uh, in the fall by looking at a few of the before after pictures that Paul lines up beginning in Romans five. So Romans five, Romans six, Romans seven, a bunch of before and after pictures. Before you were like this, but now you can be like this. Before you were like this, but now you can be like this. And so what Paul says in verse 11 of chapter six, well, you need to count, reckon, consider, and live out the after picture, not the before picture. As you're in Jesus, 
Don't live the way you used to live with those old priorities, those old values, that old power source. But now live the after picture. Exercise the gospel and live it out in your life. Live a different life because of all that God has done. Therefore, live differently. So that's kind of how the whole first half of Romans goes. Well, that brings us then to uh, chapter 8. And if you have chapter 8 now, how about if we go back and we'll read a few of those verses. So follow along, and I'm going I'm to give you a little assignment as I read. Make sure you stay awake. I know you were up late watching the snow or wishing for the snow. Uh, so you try to think of the one word that keeps coming up over and over and over and over again as I read. All right? Here we go. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. All right, I'll stop there. What was the one word kept coming up over and over and over again? Ideas? All right, flesh came up. Spirit came up over and over and over again. So let me just do a little counting for you. In Romans chapter 7, the word law appears more than 30 times. And in Romans chapter 8, the word spirit appears more than 20 times. Paul's trying to make a comparison, right? Here's what law will get you. Here is what spirit will get you. Romans 8 is all about the spirit, all about the Holy Spirit. That means as we look ahead, the big division of the book is all that law brings and the deliverance that we have from the law, 1 through 7, but now the spirit comes on the inside to energize us, transform us, and cause us to live differently. Well, that means if Romans 8 and here on out is all about the spirit, we have to kind of do a little review on who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. Well, that means uh, maybe the best place to go or one of the best places to go would be back to John's gospel. And there are no games this afternoon until like 3.30, right? So you have a little bit of time. Um, A good place for you to learn about the Spirit would be John, gospel of John, chapters 14 through 16. Just three chapters, 14, 15, 16. All about the Spirit. Let me just tease out two verses that will help us understand a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, because we have to know something about the Spirit if we're going to understand what's going on in Romans chapter 8. So here's what Jesus says in John 14 about the Spirit. I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is the other advocate advocate. If you have a different translation, it may have counselor. Jesus will pray that the Father give you another counselor. If you've got a really old weird version, it may say paraclete, not parakeet, that's a bird. Paraclete, paraclete means counselor, comforter, advocate. Those are the kind of words there. Well, that raises a question then. If the Holy Spirit is another advocate, what the heck is an advocate? Because unless you know what an advocate is, you don't know who the Holy Spirit is or what he does. Well, when you think of advocate or advocacy, our minds probably go to at least two different places. The one would be social work, the medical world, etc. Social workers take classes and practice advocacy. 
Now, what is an advocate? Here's what an advocate does. An advocate stands in your place and speaks in your place. So some of you may have had a parent or a grandparent and you're trying to organize medical care and living conditions and all of that. You will often meet with someone and that someone serves as your advocate. And the reason is there's kind of this labyrinth of structures, labyrinth of organizations, all kinds of details and hallways and back rooms that you and I know nothing about. But the advocate understands how all that works. And the advocate comes alongside of you and the advocate helps you understand the resources that are available so that you can access those resources for yourself or for your loved one. See how that works? The advocate stands in your place, puts him or herself in your spot and says, okay, now if I was in your spot, here are the resources that are out there that you may want to access. Here's what's available to you. And here's how you go about accessing those and bringing them to bear on your particular situation. That's what advocates do. Did you notice that when Jesus says he's going to send the advocate, he says, I'm going to send another advocate. Well, that's a question. And if the Holy Spirit is the second advocate, who is our first advocate? Well, that would be Jesus. And boy, does he fit the definition, right? Who is Jesus? The one who stands in our place, the one who speaks in our place. So Jesus stood in our place and took the penalty we deserve deserve. He speaks in our place so that now we can access the resources that he purchased in our lives. He's our advocate. See how it works? Stand in your place, speak in your place. Another place where you may think of advocacy or advocate would be in the legal world. If you need an attorney, and on occasion you will, um, what do attorneys do? Attorneys advocate for their clients. They stand in the place of their client and they speak in behalf of their client. So if you've ever been in a courtroom and it was serious so that you needed an attorney, you'll notice that when the judge says, will the defendant please stand? Not only the defendant stands, who else stands? The defendant's attorney stands. They are one. Your attorney stands in your place. And when your attorney speaks, Your attorney speaks in your place. That means if you have an idiot for an attorney, you're going to jail. (laughs) Your attorney stands in your place. Your attorney speaks on your behalf. So Jesus is saying, I was your advocate, and I'm going to ask the Father to send you another advocate. And what do advocates do? Advocates show because they know all the resources that are available out there, the legal world, a labyrinth of back hallways and corridors and things that you and I know nothing about. Attorneys learn all that stuff. They know all that stuff. And they know how to bring to bear the legal resources available to the predicament of their client. What does Jesus and what, do the, whole, and what does the Holy Spirit do? They make available to us, we're in the predicament, remember the problem, they make available to us, their clients, the resources that are available and the good news of that in the gospel. Jesus, our first advocate, the Holy Spirit, our second advocate. So that's who the Holy Spirit is. He's our advocate, stands in our place, speaks in our place. Jesus, the first advocate, stood in our place, took the penalty we deserve to pay, speaks on our behalf. The Spirit now, the second advocate, takes all of those resources that Jesus, the first advocate, purchased and makes them accessible and delivers them to us. That's why the second part of the beginning of Romans is what happens in us. What God does for us, what God does in us. That's the work of the second advocate, to take those resources and make them real in our lives so they're accessible to us. See how that works? Advocate. Who's the Holy Spirit? He's the second advocate. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do? Like, well, what's he spend his time doing? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, Jesus actually speaks to that too a couple chapters after John 14 and John 16. And here's what he says. Now, this is kind of in a nutshell, right? Here's what Jesus says. But when he, the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, 
He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus says, the second advocate, the spirit, he will glorify me, Jesus, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All of the resources that the Holy Spirit makes accessible to us are the resources Jesus purchased. The Spirit is the one that makes them deliverable, accessible, usable by us. That's how they work. So here's a way of thinking about it. The Holy Spirit's kind of like the shy member of the Trinity, right? Uh, some of you are shy, most of you are not, and we know those of you that are not. But, but those of you who are shy, never want to call attention to yourself, right? You want to kind of sink into, sleek into the background, push other people out ahead of you. That's kind of what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is always pushing Jesus into the limelight, always putting Jesus into the spotlight. The Holy Spirit's function, what he does, is to call our attention, call our focus to Jesus, not to himself. So, you can tell it's not the Holy Spirit if all the attention is being driven and called and focused on the Spirit. That's not what the Spirit does. The Spirit focuses attention on the Son, not on the Spirit. I find it interesting that there are some people who um, kind of must, was, must have skipped over this section of John because they think the mission of the Spirit is to glorify and emphasize the work of the Spirit. But that's not what the Spirit does. The Spirit draws attention and focus on the Son, not himself the Spirit. Well, that then uh, causes us uh, to ask, okay, but how does that work out for us? All right, so here's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is all about power. In fact, if there's one word that's almost synonymous with the Spirit, as you read through the Bible, it would be power. In fact, maybe the most famous Spirit verse in the beginning of Acts almost connects the two. Here's what it says in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes. Let me ask, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just sit there and look like you believe me. How many of you look at life and say, well, I could use some power. I want some power. I want power to be the spouse that I should be. I want power to be the parent I should be. I want power to be the child I should be, the neighbor I should be, the employee I should be, the manager I should be, the employer I should be. I want some power because I look at life. I often feel incredibly weak. I want power. Well, you've come to the right place because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Holy Spirit and power go together. So if you're feeling weak and you need power, it's the Spirit you need. But here's the important part. Not power to do whatever the heck you want. Not power to build your little kingdom. Not power necessarily to make a truckload of money. Not power to get the car you want. Not power to have the vacations of your dreams. That's not the power you get. The Holy Spirit delivers power primarily to do two things. Power to develop character and power for mission. Power for character and power for mission. Well, first of all, character. How does character get described in the scripture when it comes to the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit gives us power for character and that fits under the umbrella of the fruit of the Spirit. So if you want to read about the fruit of the Spirit, you go to Galatians 5, like 22 and 23, and you'll read there are nine things listed there. So here's, here's what Paul writes in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the character qualities that the Holy Spirit gives you power to produce. The Holy Spirit does not give you power to get ticked off and power up on people and make them so afraid of you they give you what you want. That's not the Holy Spirit doing that. In fact, the Holy Spirit will always lead into those character qualities, love, joy, peace, patience. And so if you're not being led to those things, it's not the Spirit leading you. The Spirit will always lead you to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. That's the stuff the Spirit leads to. If you're being pushed to those things, it's the Spirit doing the pushing. If you're being driven to something else, it's not the Spirit doing that. Interestingly, as you look at the fruit of the Spirit that are mentioned there, those character qualities, they're really not nine separate traits. And you kind of say, I'm really good on that one. I, I'm terrible on that one. I need to develop. No, no, no. They are nine facets of one gem. Nine characteristics of one portrait. And the portrait 
is a picture of Jesus. In fact, here would be a really good assignment for you. Take those nine characteristics and write, write them on a little piece of paper and then pick a gospel of your choosing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You want a short one, read Mark. You want kind of a later one, read John. Take those nine characteristics and just read through the gospel and see if you can find places where Jesus perfectly manifests love. You'll find it all over the place, right? How does Jesus manifest joy, peace, in the midst and poised during difficult circumstances, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. How did you, Jesus, it's Jesus' picture. They're not nine separate scales, nine facets of one gem, nine characteristics of one portrait. The spirit produces character. That character is called the fruit in the scripture. But the Spirit does more than that. The Spirit doesn't just give us power for character. The Spirit also gives us power for service, or we can maybe say better, power for mission. Isn't that what Acts 1.8 says? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Not power to go do whatever you want. Power for mission. Power for service. If the fruit of the Spirit tell us how he produces character. The gifts of the Spirit tell us how he produces power for mission. So when you read, you can read through 1 Corinthians 12, for example, and other places. The Spirit gives gifts of teaching, hospitality, faith, prayer, generosity, and other gifts. They're not fruit. Every one of us are to manifest all of the fruit of the Spirit. None of us manifest all the gifts of the Spirit. You have at least one gift, maybe a gift, you know, a little gift mix. We are all to use those gifts, those powerful enablements for ministry God gives to, to extend the mission, bearing the fruit of character as we live out the gifts and exercise the gifts for mission. So that's kind of how this Holy Spirit works. Well, now... We can go back to Romans 8. We've looked back and we've kind of understood a little bit through the buts where Paul is in his thinking. All of this has been done by Jesus. Now in light of that, in consequence of that, as a result of that, now we're going to talk about what the Holy Spirit does. And lo and behold, what does verse 1 of Romans 8 say? Therefore, that's what we've been doing, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I have to tell you right now, I am really disappointed. There is now no condemnation for all, and you just sit there. I've seen pictures of you on Instagram and little videos on Facebook of some of you celebrating at birthday parties, at wedding receptions, acting like idiots. I've seen you. Celebrating last year when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Celebrating when the Flyers win. Celebrating when the... And I talk about there's no condemnation for those of you in Jesus, and you just sit there. That that kind of shows where our thinking, though, is, right? We celebrate the little tiny things that bring joy for a moment, and yet Paul writes, there is now no condemnation. There is none today. Here's here's the language, how he actually says it. There is no condemnation today. There will be no condemnation tomorrow. There can be no condemnation for anyone in Christ Jesus because Jesus took all the condemnation. That is a reason to celebrate. Now, Sometimes I watch Christians, people that go to church, and here's what I think they must be thinking, which is very different than what Paul says. So think of the no condemnation as kind of like a no condemnation umbrella. So you're standing under the no condemnation umbrella, and the storm of condemnation is raging outside of it, but you're under the umbrella, you're good, right? But as soon as you screw up or mess up, You step out from under the umbrella and now you're in the torrent of condemnation again. Can I tell you, that's not what Paul says. If that's the message, we're in a world of trouble because I would live outside the umbrella most of the time. The message of Romans 8.1 is this. There is no condemnation. 
There will be none and can be none. It's not an umbrella. It is a giant building that was built by Jesus and you're in the building forever. There is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. That's the message. That's the foundation from which we live. That's why we can sing as we started this morning, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing what God has done. What great things has God done? This is the greatest of the great things he has done. What should we continue to remind ourselves of what Paul will say soon after this? The, the magical, wonderful, amazing, miraculous transition. We who were orphans disconnected from God have been adopted into his family and now there is no condemnation forever for those that are in Christ Jesus. I was thinking about that. And uh, sorry, but here, here's the illustration that came to my mind. Sitting at my desk the other day, sitting there thinking, but what a difference uh, Bill Cosby lived, huh? I mean, just a few years ago, he was Dr. Heathcliff Huxtable. I mean, he was the role model for millions of men and boys. He was honored and looked up to, esteemed, admired. Universities bending over backwards to give him honorary degrees. Everybody wanted to have him on their show. Everybody trying to hire him for this. But then there was a series of sexual abuse accusations. There was a trial. There was a conviction. He was condemned. He was sentenced. And he sits in prison. My guess is 15 years ago, Many of you wouldn't have minded changing, trading places with him. Nobody wants to trade places with Cosby today. Living condemnation only on the human scale. And it's painful to think about, isn't it? Well, compare the Cosby story to another account. You can read about this at the beginning of John chapter 8. In the beginning of John chapter 8... A woman isn't just accused, she is caught in the act of sexual immorality and adultery. She's immediately brought before the authorities. The evidence, crystal clear. The trial convenes. The evidence is brought forth. Condemnation will certainly follow. Oh, yeah. But she has an advocate. And her advocate bends down and draws in the sand. And then he stands up and he says, uh, okay, here's the deal, guys. She is guilty. No question about it. Any of you guys that are without sin, you can execute punishment first. Well, that ruined that party. They all went home and eventually Jesus was alone with the woman. And do you know what Jesus says to her? I do not condemn you. Go. Sin no more. Jesus doesn't make light of her sin. He calls it what it is. He doesn't say, well, you really didn't mean it. I know. Oh, you didn't really do it. No, no, no. She meant it and she did it. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you. And as you read through the rest of John's gospel, you discover the payment that that first advocate had to make so that he could say there's no condemnation to her. You read that at the end of John's gospel. And then the second advocate comes and takes that message, that work of Jesus, and applies it to us so that there is now no condemnation forever for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, friends, that is the center out of which we need to live. I'm not sure if you're big on kind of Bible memory stuff. Some of you I know have memorized dozens of verses. Some of you have never memorized any verses. And, and that's cool. We're glad you're here. But I'll tell you what. You could do a whole lot worse than memorizing this verse. It's pretty short, right? It begins with therefore. You should remember what that means because we talked about that like for 20 minutes. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. It almost rolls off your tongue. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. 
You can't live out of something you don't know. You can't live out of something you're not thinking about. So maybe to help us remember to live out of this center, maybe it'd be a good practice for us to uh, memorize a verse. In fact, if we say it enough times, we'll probably memorize it before you even leave today. Oh yeah, how about if we do this? In closing, let's stand. And let's read Romans 8, 1 together. And let's remind ourselves that on the basis of what Christ has accomplished, as a consequence, as a result, there is now no condemnation to all of us in Jesus. The question isn't, is there condemnation? The question is, are you in Jesus? That's what makes the difference. So let's read it together. Ready? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in. Let's pray. Father, it's hard for us even to think about the truth of that. Because, Lord, if we're going to be honest, we know that we deserve and we've earned condemnation over and over and over again. But the great news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, our advocate, stood in our place, received the penalty and the wages that we earned, and now gives to us what he's earned, life, quality, quantity, forever and ever. Lord, I pray that in gratitude and thanksgiving, we would now continue what he started. So Lord, help us this week to not live out of the messages that we've received growing up, not to live out of the messages that we tell ourselves, but to live out of the message that you tell us from Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What great news. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.